<coughs> data privacy. What does it actually mean? I mean, um, so we we all, uh, when we go through the internet, uh, leave a lot of information there, which can be pointed to us, or at least uh, leave a trail, which makes it um, kind of easy sometimes for algorithms to identify us, get information about us, um, even even know us better than we know ourselves, right? So um, probably in a few years, Google can tell us. Um, can can make better suggestions what we should buy and what we should wear, or Amazon or or uh, Siri or how they are all called, what we should wear, what we should buy better than we know what would be best for ourselves. So um, this is this is going to be a crazy time. But what all these algorithms need is data, a lot of data, right? So because the more data, the more accurate the um, the algorithms can predict um, or can can produce outputs. So, and this is this is like why why companies are collecting so many data. Like, so you can do a lot of stuff with data. You can actually analyze your customers, improve your products, um, know what what your customers need, um, get them addicted to your product, um, make them feel really comfortable with your product, whatever your product is. But um, the more data you have. The more, um, well, the, the better the user experience you can provide um, is going to become. So, um, actually, having no byte data privacy sounds like a great thing, right? <laughs> so, because uh, life might get easier. But of course, it comes to the downside. I mean, um, everybody, or like, like uh, trusting. Entities um, you don't know, you don't know what they are actually really doing with your data. With personal data is really critical, especially if it comes to to financial data. And if you look at a transaction, um, it's like every transaction has like a recipient and uh, a sender, and of course, I mean the most important part is the reason for the transaction, like the the reference, right? So every time you do a, do a transaction, you have a reason why you do this transaction, and um, this is something um, you typically don't want to be public. Also, you don't want to be like if the transaction is already public, like it is with Bitcoin, uh, you don't want to be uh, mentioned there as a recipient or as a um, as a uh, as a sender. So this is uh, this is really really critical, and this is of course why uh, if you look at a Bitcoin transaction, it's. Um, there's actually no information about who the recipient is and who the sender is and what the reason for the transactions is. But of course, you can like do, you can collect information. You can do data mining. You can do analysis. Um, like you, if you have an entry point in an exchange, and the exchange does KYC, so know your customer, um, they can actually forward this information if requested, uh, for example, by law. To companies who who analyze the trail of the money mm -hmm. coming from this exchange, from your account, going through different wallets, going through different addresses, and can like make um, or algorithms can can help them to understand who is actually doing what with the money. So it's um, if I mean, so it, I hope no one here is thought Bitcoin is really anonymous, um, but uh, if you still thought Bitcoin is anonymous, no, no it's not, it's more like synonymous, so there's like of course no personal information about yourself, but you have uh, like something like an address uh, in there, um, which represents you kind of, right, because you have control over this address. A week later, later in this evening we come to different approaches uh, on that, Florian will talk about this. <laughs> And um, this will be really interesting to see how, how it could work without addresses. But um, so a Bitcoin in general it works with an address, and address is like a synonymous uh, for a synonym uh, for the person, typically. Or an entity is however this entity looks like. If it's an, a computer or if it's a company, it's some kind of entity. And in this example here, we just know okay, there's. Uh, there's one guy, <laughs> you probably know him, um, who paid uh, uh, 10,000 bitcoins to, um, we actually also don't, do know the recipient as I think, but uh, like this is public information for two pizzas, he paid 10,000 bitcoins for two pizzas, 
And this is the transaction above. You don't see any information about the reason for the transaction. You don't know who is the sender and you don't know who is the recipient. You should just look at the transaction. But of course, if you look at additional data, which is available online, you can connect the dots and know, okay, this transaction was made for this reason, made by this guy, and uh, the other guy uh, was the recipient of 10,000 bitcoins. And uh, all the related transactions, when it was happening, and uh, how much fees involved, and, and so on, as everything uh, is, is documented on the blockchain. So, but um, so this this brings me now to to like the idea of thinking as a company and nothing about your company because so basically uh, this is how a transaction looks like you have an address uh, as the sender you have an address as the recipient and you have the transaction itself which is yeah like the amount the transaction ID and the fee of course there are some more information uh, on the blockchain but like this is like, the most important uh, informations which are publicly available for everyone. Like you can just scroll through it and find everything, which every transaction which is happening on the blockchain. But what what happens um, to the actual name of the sender and the actual recipient of the sender, and of course the reference? I mean, these two guys who are interacting with each other, or these two entities who are interacting with each other, other they have a reason, and they, of course, they know or sometimes don't know who they are, but uh, like they actually know the um, reference for the transaction. And what happens now if you want to document this uh, reference? You probably won't put it on the blockchain because then it would be available for everyone and algorithms can just go through it and make their data analysis and find out what's going on and what uh, Bitcoin is being used for. I mean, obviously now it's not the darknet anymore, but uh, in the early <laughs> stages it was, it was it pretty, pretty much where a lot of uh, darknet transactions on there. Um, but you, you actually don't don't want that be public if you do a transaction on Bitcoin. It's like if you if you give someone uh, 100 euros in cash, um, or using using real cash, uh, physical cash, you don't want to know everyone in the world why this transaction happened, right? So it's just a, a thing which happened between you and uh, and the other guy or the other entity. So, but if you think about okay, what what. Um, uh, or where did I spend my money, what happened over time, and um, what, what transactions did I do over time. It's like kind of hard to document everything and you need to do it like on your own, right? So it's not like if you uh, do a transaction through, um, through a bank wire transfer, where you have a um, reference field, and this reference field is uh, available for the recipient and for you as a sender, and you can always uh, go through it and remember, okay, I, uh, this transaction was happened for that reason, and um, this is a transaction I, did, I received for that reason, so you can, I can do my tax or whatever I need to do, or my budgeting um, and everything I need to do based on this information. This is not possible with, uh, with Bitcoin, because you don't want to have this information publicly available. So, what you could do is like, um, yeah, uh, document this transaction in a, in a way, like in a spreadsheet, for example, or <coughs> using Blockkeeper. Like this is the only thing <laughs> I'm going to talk about the product. You can use you can use Block, Blockkeeper to document the transaction, but even even if you use Blockkeeper, you don't want to you don't want to like have this company information about your transaction, right? So you don't want to trust anyone about why you did this transaction and what happened on the blockchain. You want to keep it as private as possible. And uh, this brings me to the, to the last topic, um, uh, which is what does it actually mean for a company to know nothing about customers? Uh, what, does it, what does it mean for a customer to really apply data privacy? Um, so. And one thing is, if you think about the registration process, um, to, to sign up for an account because you need to have like kind of um, um, a solution to uh, identify persons uh, and the relevant data connected to this person or to this entity somehow, but you don't want to actually, you don't want to know who this entity is. Um, in, like, you don't want to ask for the email address, right? You don't want to know the name, you don't want to know anything. So, this makes already the registration and the sign up process a little bit more complicated than just using email address and passwords. So, we use this, or we, we, we solve this by using uh, unique, um, unique identifiers. Um, 
and unique identifiers are in this case randomly generated and being um, presented to the user um, by being generated on the user's device um, and then you can, can save these identifiers. So it's basically similar to a, to a public key, you could say. So if you're familiar to public-private key pairs, so this is quite familiar to a public key. And then, of course, like passwords are also like a weak point here. And um, we solve this in, in a way that we don't ask the users for a password. Um, we don't have passwords at all. We kind of have to have a, a solution which is called crypto keys. And crypto keys are um, responsible for um, um, yeah, like, like decrypt and encrypt the information which is being handled in the app. And this crypto key is also randomly generated. So similar to public private key pairs, so if you're familiar with that, you should, of course. <laughs> I hope no one here has uh, bitcoins on exchange unless you're actively trading. You know what's happening on, um, on January 3rd? January 3rd, right? Is it January 3rd? Who knows what happens on January 3rd? Oh. <laughs> yeah. okay. this, is, this is one point, of course. <laughs> but it's related. Okay, but it's related. So the idea is on January 3rd, uh, 3rd um, just to, to keep you posted here, it was, uh, initial, this idea was initiated by Trace Mayer. Trace Mayer? Trace May, Mayer, somehow like that. <laughs> uh, and he, he said, okay, let's, let's uh, on, on January 3rd, let's take all our bitcoins from the exchanges, put them on our wallets where we control our private keys and make sure that all the exchanges have the funds they claim to have, right? So because they are acting like a bank, so you you don't own the bitcoins lying, laying around there, So, but um, they promise you to pay you these bitcoins if you want to do a withdrawal. But basically they control everything for you and they own what kind of your bitcoins. So you're not really the owner. And the idea is on January 3rd that everyone takes his bitcoins, who has bitcoins on an exchange. Uh, and even if you're actively trading on an exchange, just take it to your wallet where you control your private keys and make sure they are still there. After that, you can decide if you put them back on an exchange for active trading. But uh, this is like the basic idea behind that. So back to the topic here. <laughs> So, but what does it mean? So, um, typically, um, like if if we would collect uh, a lot of informations like this uh, about who's recipient, who's sender, um, what is the reason for the transaction, there might be a lot of um, parties uh, coming and be interested in this kind of data because it's kind of a kind of valuable data, especially for example for for tax authorities or other authorities. But this is, a, this is really, really interesting information. Um, and uh, like the extreme form of knowing everything about your customer is uh, this regulation uh, constitution called KYC. So know your customer, know like everything about you. I mean, if you sign up for an exchange, you probably know the process. You need to make a picture of your, uh, or like scan your, make a picture of yourself together with your um, ID card or like do run through other identification process that the exchange knows who you are and what you, where you live and uh, what you eat for breakfast. Other companies are currently thinking about is like actually don't know your customer, right? So just have a lot of anonymous or yeah, really anonymous uh, people uh, on, on your app, you don't know who they are, what they are actually doing, what, they, what data they collect. Um, and this is, this, is an, this is a movement which is, which is just about to start and it's really hard because um, the problem is um, you don't maybe know um, that a customer is existing. You maybe also know how often they log in. Um, Maybe in our case we know the number of wallets are added, but that's it, right? So that's it. This is all the information we have, and this makes it really hard to like improve the product, get feedback from customers, communicate with them, reach out to them, uh, send them emails, talk to them, however it looks like, um, get feedback from them, know what they are doing, where they are happy with, what, which function they use, which function they don't use. Like it's it's really hard to to uh, improve products and work on products without that. And also, if you think about uh, business models, it makes it even harder. 
Because typically, if you think about uh, big companies in the, in the industry, in the, in the tech industry, it's most of the times they make money by collecting your data. And if you, if you do a startup um, and you don't have a, revenue, a business model and you don't have a revenue stream, investors don't care as long as you collect a lot of data. Because if, even if you don't know yet how to use this data, this data might be really, really valuable in the future. So they just invest, or a lot of investors just invest in, in, in data collecting companies. And I mean, the biggest one you obviously know is Facebook. Um, Facebook's business model is just selling your data, but in an aggregated form, of course, to advertisers, but it's about selling your data. And it's, it's, um, it's something you always like, like or sometimes you, you just should think about, like what you're, what you're exposing to the internet is some other um, company's business. Draw our money with that. So, but if you don't do this, um, yeah, you cannot monetize this data, you don't understand uh, customer behaviors and needs, you can com communicate, as I said. So it, it makes, makes it really hard for companies to, to work this way, and it's, it's, like, a, it's like something which is, which is uh, in the very beginning and which takes time, and, um, but we, which also, also needs the engagement of, of users to specifically look for services and companies uh, applying those rules, those don't know your customers' rules, don't know anything about your customers' rules, don't store data of, your, of the customers uh, unencrypted or in a way encrypted that they can access, uh, access it. So, but basically make sure services you use are uh, anonymized data or even better, completely encrypt them so no one has access but yourself as a user. Yeah, that's it from my side. Um, and I think now we are going to look a little bit more deeper into uh, alternative tech uh, Bitcoin and how Bitcoin's privacy can improved can be improved um, so that it's even more synonymous or uh, more um, anonymous. And on the other side, what alternative maybe technologies are out there which which work with different <coughs> concepts and make it even harder for. Um, people outside a transaction to uh, understand what was happening there. Great, thanks.